How do you put into words your experience of the holy? I was 14 years old. It was long past curfew, yet there I was, lying on a rooftop, holding hands with friends I had made at the Seeds of Fire sleepaway camp at Highlander Center, a social justice organizing school on a farm in Newmarket, Tennessee. We had spent the day hiking, playing and singing with renowned folk musicians Guy and Candy Carawan as the sun set. Hours later, I was awakened by a friend's invitation to climb up on the roof and lay there in the chilly midnight. A group of us, silent with our hands entwined. The stars cascaded across the sky and for a fleeting moment, there was no roof, no me, no friends, only an eternity of stars. It was a hospital room. And even though machines stuck to him and I could only touch his translucent skin through plastic sheeting, the second my newborn son heard my voice and his tiny head whipped towards mine, our eyes locked into that ancient animal wisdom and we beheld and in our beholding we became each other's world. Time stopped. It was one second. It was an hour. I have no idea. It was the most terrible, most gorgeous spring day. Someone I love had just died though every bright blossom dazzled with an energetic pulse that could only be described as aggressive. Waves of grief and disorientation brought me to my knees, and I was afraid it would never end. The comforting presence came out of nowhere. Suddenly, I felt held. What do you call this? Some Unitarian Universalists would call it God. The behavioral psychologist Abraham Maslow might have called these peak experiences, moments of intense wonder, joy, or a sense of the eternal. Our children's story today, Hide and Seek with God by Unitarian Universalist religious educator Marianne Moore, beautifully expresses our current theology of God as Unitarian Universalists. We are in relationship with the search for truth and meaning, which could be called God. The search never ends. Though we may rebel against the term, one we associate with pushiness or proselytizing. We Unitarian Universalists are a religion. In the ancient sense of the term religare, the Latin verb religare meaning to rebind. The Latin noun religio referring to, referring to obligation, bond, or reverence is probably based on religare. So religio and its English derivation, religion, connote a rebinding. Across the ages, this term has also meant to return again, to study, a sense of practice and obligation. To be called a religion, we may not need God at all. Unlike most religions, we Unitarian Universalists have no creed. We have no one statement of belief to which we all must ascribe, though we are bound together still. Not by our creeds, but by our deeds, by our covenant to love one another, to stay in relationship, to work for peace and justice, and to support each other in the responsible search for truth and meaning. 
When a young person is being, being raised in our religion, comes of age, they undergo somewhat of a reverse confirmation. They spend a year studying with a mentor who asks them challenging questions about what they value and how they wish to live. <clears throat> Rather than memorize a passage of a single sacred text or recite a creed, they go before the congregation and share their personal belief system, often with a strong sense that it could or should change at various points throughout their lifetime. We often refer to this statement of belief as their credo, meaning I believe. As Unitarian Universalist minister Dr. Galen Gingrich writes, the Latin word credo usually appears in our language as the word creed, such as the Apostles' Creed used by most Christians in their worship. But one possible derivation of the Latin word credo combines two other Latin words, cor, meaning heart, and do, from the verb meaning to give. On these terms, cor, do, originally meant I give my heart. To believe in something is to give your heart to it. In Gingrich's view, a credo is not primarily about whether you believe the Bible is true or God is spirit. It is about what you aspire to give your heart to. A credo is a commitment that guides our conduct because our commitments emerge from the depths of our hearts. They define who we are, not by specifying our beliefs, but by revealing the choices we have made about how we intend to live. These choices emerge in response to our feelings of humility and awe in the face of the beauty and grandeur of life. These feelings become religious when they are accompanied by a sense of duty to the larger life that we share. But what of those peak experiences, those encounters with the holy? Gingrich responds again, writing, we may experience the world and our place in it as sanctus, which means holy. We feel reverence for what Baton calls necessities greater than ourselves. He reminds us of the story in the Hebrew Bible about a man named Job who was wealthy and blessed until suddenly all manner of bad things began happening to him. Job asks God why he has been made to suffer although he has been good. God replies, Do not be surprised that things have not gone your way. The universe is greater than you. See how small you are next to the mountains. Accept what is bigger than you and what do you do not understand. There are many other ways as well to find times and places where the beauty of life amazes us and humbles us, perhaps even brings us to our knees. As the poet John O'Donohue puts it, we awaken and surrender in the same act. And we respond with a plea for mercy, or a word of praise, or a recognition of our duty, or a holy silence. Why go to church? We gather each week to put our lives and our world into perspective, to acknowledge the tragedy of life, and to be enlivened by its possibilities. In doing so, we find a place for ourselves, a home for our common humanity. Together, we feel ourselves being held in the comforting arms of an ancient embrace. All this from Dr. Gingrich. Well, at this point in a global pandemic, you might feel far away from that ancient embrace. This has been a week, a time where we have found our spirits challenged anew. We struggle with rage at our fellow humans who seem incapable of behavior change for the common good. We are mired in grief for those who are sick or dying alone in a hospital still. We wrestle with confusion and decision fatigue 
to mitigate our risk or our children's risk and simple bone-deep exhaustion at the ongoing situation. All this amidst continued crises of wildfires, earthquakes, hurricanes, and an alarming report from the International Panel on Climate Change charting a bleak life for our children's children. In our overwhelm, we may feel it is easier to distance ourselves from one another or from our religion that embraces us best when we are physically together. It's true. While we you use may not have a common creed, in our most Jobian moments, when our spirits are tested beyond anything we have known, we do still believe in each other. We believe that what we do as individuals and as a collective still matters. We believe in the healing power of mutual support and finding a million creative ways to answer the question that matters most. Not what God you do or don't believe in, but what do you set your heart to? This question is worth a lifetime of seeking. It is a good thing we don't have to do it alone. So whether you find God in the fresh growth of spring, in forest bathing, in the deep dark night, in acts of human kindness, or nowhere at all, the important thing is to keep asking the deep questions, making meaning as we make our lives together. Amen.